Hello and welcome to Murder with Friends, the show where two friends get together and talk about the darker sides of history. I'm your host, Grace Baldridge, and joining me today, making her Murder with Friends debut, Brooke Thomas. Welcome to the show. I am so excited to be here. And then also, just I just had like, are we friends? Is that what just happened? Yeah, no, just it just it that's, sometimes what I do is, is I just that? announce that to people when they come on the show. Okay, I'm I really like people to I'm be like, in limbo okay, for it's a while. A good day. But if you're on here, <laughs> you have to be my friend. <laughs> Murder with Friends, um, Brooke. So. You brought a case to me that I hadn't really thought about before, but absolutely applies. Um, but first, can you just tell our viewers what your interest is in true crime? Just like everyone else. I always say, um, you know how, have you ever seen a story where someone goes missing and they're investigating the family? And I feel like every single time a family member is a suspect, mm -hmm. there's this, oh, they had all these books about killers and serial killers and their search history on their computer, it was all true crimes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, is that suspicious? Oh, I think about that all the time. <laughs> I think about that way that's too me. much. Is that, yeah. what, is that I thought that was normal. Yeah, well, it's it's not, but there's a show for it, so you're in the right place. <laughs> it's not normal, that's the, terrible. The case that you brought to me uh, was the case of Marvin Gaye, mm -hmm. who was murdered by his own father. But I can't I, take all the credit for this to Jason. Oh. This was his idea. Jason. He was talking about something I was interested in, and uh -huh. he was like, "Oh, you like this? Uh huh. Like, You're right. Interesting. I okay. Well, we love having Jason on the show too. Mm -hmm. He's he's done some of my favorite episodes from this season. But I wanted to sort of expand the story of the death of Marvin Gaye uh, a little bit broader. So today we're going to be talking about fathers who kill. We're gonna be examining three cases, and then in part three, we're gonna talk about the psychology behind familicide. But we're gonna start off with the case that you brought to me, which is Marvin Gaye. And so just to kick it off, here's a video element narrated by our dear Amir. April 1st, 1984, two gunshots pierce a quiet afternoon in Los Angeles, California. Grammy award-winning artist Marvin Gaye has been shot once in the heart and once in the shoulder by his own father, Marvin Gaye Sr. While their relationship had been contentious for some years, the shooting will shock the world. How could an argument over a misplaced insurance letter turn into a murder? And how does Marvin Gaye's murder play into his legacy as a music icon? Today on Murder with Friends. So before we can get into the tragic death of Marvin Gaye, I think we need to talk about his life. And I've seen him described as the prince of Motown. How do you understand Marvin Gaye? As always as a super successful but troubled man. Mm -hmm. And it's surprising that you know you didn't know so much about how troubled he was. I think yeah. a lot of people didn't realize that. I, for some reason, I think when um, stories like when Britney Spears kind of had her breakdown. This was something that was brought up like, oh, this is not the first time. This is what happens when people are given so much success so quickly. Sometimes it's too much to handle. And he was struggling with drugs. Yeah. Family issues, relationship issues. Well, also, I mean, a tax evasion. Like, I, what I was reading in Marvin Gaye's biography, I had mm -hmm. no idea how much he really moved around to try and evade the IRS because there was so many issues with how he was uh, paying his taxes. And uh, at one point in time, he, uh, I don't want to say fled, but uh -huh. he sort of went to Belgium, which is uh, where I'm from. So I thought that was kind of cool. And they said that he had a really nice time there. Um, but he was moving around. He was a troubled person. It wasn't yeah. just like he created this, you know, this style of music. I, I saw that he was credited for basically creating Neo Soul, which I, which makes sense. But I, I hadn't know, really that thought about that yeah, before. He totally was sort of like the, the grandfather of Neo Soul. Um, Someone who battled depression. Yeah. Well, and, and, and suicide. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that you think of Marvin Gaye's music, it, it stirs up a feeling, it really does. For sure. And that feeling is not depressed, that feeling is not dark, it's certainly not suicidal. And so to hear that actually people in his life were very well aware of the struggles that he was going through was pretty shocking to me. But I think it sort of goes to show how we color history in a certain way. Oh, you know what I mean? Like, right, and yeah. how we just look back with rose colored glasses and we exclude the parts that aren't really convenient to someone's story or our understanding of an icon. But I think it all plays into Marvin's story and it's really important to talk about. You think smooth and sexual kind of ladies man and confident, not depression and intense paranoia. Well, the paranoia was something that 
was really striking to me to hear different accounts of, I mean, that's really heartbreaking when mm -hmm. you know that someone is technically fine, like right. in their immediate surroundings, but the, the fear, um, and part of that was, you know, stemmed from uh, mental illness, and then also some of that was he had a crazy cocaine addiction. Mm -hmm. um, and he was able to, you know, to pay for it because at one point in time, he was earning $100,000 a night. So an insane amount of money. And uh, the, the people that were surrounding him, some of them were pretty questionable, and some of them, like his own father, had a very contentious relationship with him. So that now comes into play. Brooke, what can you tell us about the relationship with Marvin and his father? It seemed like a relationship where there was a constant battle since childhood. Depending on who you talk to, depending on what interview you're watching, um, there was something we were talking about earlier, how um, Many people, I saw multiple people say that the rumors were that it was an open secret that his father was a crossdresser mm -hmm. and that Marvin hated that and hated that as a child. And that was kind of part of the beginning of some of their issues. And then it, it just seemed like a very verbally abusive relationship from the beginning, before the fame started, before the drugs started, before. Um, the mental issues were identified. Yeah, it didn't seem like anyone is describing a healthy relationship between and father and son. Even further than that, I, the the, the cross-dressing was something I had never heard of before, Neither. and I also didn't know why Marvin Gaye added the E to the end of his name was in part because Neither. of the teasing that uh, he said he endured because of his father's cross-dressing. And then just to add another layer on top of that. Um, Marvin Gaye's father, so Marvin Gaye Sr., was a minister, was a prominent minister in the community. Um, I, I wasn't able to find any of his sermons or any transcripts of that, but I ostensibly you can think about what you hear in church, which is all about family values and traditional family values and whatever that means in a biblical sense, and that is a whole nother conversation with me. Um, <laughs> right. But we're talking about, you know, this is like the 1970s, uh, 1980s, 1982 is when sexual healing came out, but he had a, a string of hits in the 1970s as well. This is a very regressive time when it comes to like exploring one's sexual identity. So while it's easy for us to say, probably in the comments section below, cross-dressing, like I don't know why that's that big of a right. deal. Why would someone be so rampantly teased by that? It's obviously something that Marvin really internalized. And on, on top of just a number of other family dynamics at play, Marvin and his father had a very strained relationship. And it only became more strained as Marvin uh, got further into addiction, as money problems were coming up, and as, as Marvin seemed to really sink deeper and deeper into the, the black hole that is mental illness. It's incredibly heartbreaking. So this brings us to the night that he was shot. And something that's kind of eerie is that he was born April 2nd, 1939, and he would be shot on April 1st. So just a day before his birthday. 45th birthday? Yeah, yeah, 1984, which is like, that's so weird. So young. So young, it's so young. So what do you know about the circumstances surrounding the, the, the night of the shooting? That there were- Well, the afternoon of the shooting. That there was a gun in the house mm -hmm. that Marvin had actually purchased because he had been feeling like someone was out to get him. Someone was out to get his family. And so he brought this gun into the home for protection of his entire family. And so the idea that that was the gun that ended up taking his life is bizarre. Right. Um, and let alone the fact that his father was the shooter. Mm -hmm. And another thing that just in my like recent research that I didn't, didn't know about and I thought was interesting, after the shooting, his brother lived next door with his wife and his wife heard the gunshots when they called the EMTs, when they, um, the first responders were there and outside and would not come in the house. Marvin was still alive, lying in his brother's arms and they would not come in the house until the gun and his father were out of the house. And then of course, I just never thought of that. And of course you would think, well, duh, it's not right. safe. For Especially them when you can identify the, the shooter. That's exactly. something you always hear in 911 protocol, like is the shooter in the house? Yes. You know where the person that's maybe broken in is. And they're like, yeah, we do, he's right there. They're like, all right, well, right we there. can't. It's our dad. Yeah, oh well, my gosh, And so they're crazy. out there, and it took 10 minutes to because for the sister-in-law to find the gun. Mm -hmm. She asked him, where's the gun? And he says, what gun? While Marvin is lying dying in his brother's arm, arms in the other room, and he says, what gun? And he was kind of in this daze, as you can imagine. Right, right. And finally, she found the gun under a pillow or in a pillowcase under a mm -hmm. pillow, she finds the gun. They get the gun and him out of the house and then the EMTs are able to go in 
and get Marvin and he died on the way to the hospital, is that right? Or did he die at the hospital? I think he was pronounced dead at the hospital, but from what I've read, it seemed like he was he was in pretty bad shape as yeah. soon as the EMTs got him into the ambulance. Um, it's, it's really, really tragic and it's kind of crazy to think about the series of events that led up to this, which Marvin and his father argued a lot, really heated arguments. This was not a unique situation. This wasn't unprecedented. And it, it no one would have, it really seems like no one in the house expected that this would have been the boiling point, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but there was an altercation, a physical altercation prior to the shooting that I think is important to bring up. Um, and this would come into play when Marvin Gaye Sr. went to trial. They had to bring in the photographs of what, you know, the, of the scuffle and the marks that Marvin Gaye Jr. had uh, inflicted on Sr., on his own father. I mean, just, there was a major struggle here. But then, as I understand, and correct me if you've read something different, Brooke, that Marvin Gaye Sr. still had to go to another room to get the gun and then come into the room where Marvin was with his mother and then shoot him. So that to me makes me think there was even, there, even if it was, there was a passionate moment happening, there was still that moment of premeditation where you walked away and you got the gun. Like, what'd you get the gun for? It's, instead of this idea, at least from all of the interviews I've watched from people who were there or people who had firsthand knowledge of the family and the issues within the family, it's less, it's more often described as two people who were sick and tired of each other than two people who got in a surprise argument and just something crazy happened. It, it almost seems like as accidental as this was, yeah. two people who we're not it's happy true. with each other over time. Marvin Gaye Sr. would go on to tell the Los Angeles Examiner, I didn't mean to do it. And then the judge, Judge Ronald M. Jord, um, George, that's not a hard name to read. And yet there I was, just Jord, just butchering it. The judge's name was Ronald M. George. He agreed to grant Marvin a plea deal. And part of that was because of the amount of drugs that were found in Marvin Gaye Jr.'s system. So that played into it. Um, just cir circumstances and witness testimony about what was going on. And then the pictures of the injuries between both men at the final fight. Um, and the fact that Marvin Gaye Sr. was sick. Yes, that was. But he ended up living yeah. what 15 years after that, and yeah, he sentenced him to a six-year suspended sentence and five years probation. And uh, then I found this quote of what Marvin Gaye Sr. tearfully told the court uh, following his sentencing. He said, if I could bring him back, I would. I was afraid of him. I thought I was going to get hurt. I didn't know what was going to happen. I'm really sorry for everything that happened. I loved him. I wish he could step through this door right now. I'm paying the price now. Mm -hmm. How do you think um, his legacy is impacted by the fact that he died so tragically and that all this played out so publicly too. Do you know what's so fascinating? His legacy has not been impacted by this because how many people today only know what's going on in sexual healing and have no idea all of those things that we just talked about? How many people have no idea? Yeah. Then you know, it, and then you'd say yeah. his dad actually shot and killed him and they're like, what? Mm -hmm. I think that's fascinating that it, it hasn't. Been impacted. Yeah, and it, it again sort of goes to see how we color the stories of certain individuals. Mm -hmm. And part of me um, feels sort of uh, grateful that we've done that because th it seems like there was a lot of pain and there was a lot of hurt behind closed doors, a lot of secrecy in this family, and a lot of violence and abuse. Mm -hmm. And the music has has endured, and the music that is so timeless that you know comes on uh, like whenever it comes on, you you have this sort of like sense of acknowledgement around like a target or something with someone where you're like, oh, we all everybody loves this song, like everybody loves Marvin Gaye, and I think that that is fortunate, and that he hasn't his reputation and his legacy hasn't been marred by this really tragic ending. That while I go back and forth, I'm like, what did you think you were doing when you got the gun, yeah, and, senior? You know what? I, I go back and forth on the premeditation, but I don't think, especially given the other cases we're going to be talking about. Today, it fits into that category mm -hmm. of familicide of a father who, like, premeditated, bl cold hearted, bloodlust almost for killing their loved ones. And can you imagine just what you just said, the quote you just read? I was terrified of him, I was afraid of him. And so, in that moment, the father is afraid of the son. Mm -hmm. And also, in that moment, the son is afraid of everyone. Yeah, the paranoia. It, it, what else could have possibly happened? Oh man, it's so tragic. It's so tragic, but we have three other <laughs> equally tragic cases to get into. We're gonna be talking about fathers who kill today on the show. Our next part two, we're gonna be talking about John List. He was a mass murderer who killed his family and was on the run for 18 years and then got caught with a little help of a television program. Stay with us.